Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a celebrated author and leading Hollywood historian whose books are a real treasure trove for lovers of show business history. Her first book is Hollywood Heartbreak, the tragic and mysterious deaths of Hollywood's most remarkable legends. It gives a 75-year history of Hollywood told through the lives and deaths of some of its greatest stars. Her next book was the immensely popular Hollywood Haunted, a ghostly tour of Filmland, covering more than a hundred years of grisly events in Hollywood. Next came Dishing Hollywood, the real scoop on Tinseltown's most notorious scandals, a delicious book that spills the beans on 43 Tinseltown scandals with fitting recipes connected to each story. Then came Timmy's in the Well, the John Provost story, co-written with her husband, John Provost, who played Timmy, on the original beloved TV series, Lassie. That book was followed up by TV Dinners, 40 classic TV kid stars dish up favorite recipes with a side of memories, featuring recollections and favorite dishes from 40 of the most popular child stars of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And most recently, she's just released her latest book, Top of the Mountain, the Beatles at Shea Stadium 1965, which takes us back to that monumentally groundbreaking concert, which changed the trajectory, not only of the Beatles career, but of the entire pop music industry. No band had ever played at a baseball stadium, but the Beatles sold out Shea Stadium, shattering all box office records in show business history with a staggering 56,000 screaming fans in attendance. The book is packed with hundreds of never before seen photos and dozens of interviews with people who were there, including celebrities, opening act performers, media personnel, agents, producers, and fans. The book is an absolute must have for every Beatles fan. Our guest has written and produced documentaries, TV series, and specials, including the 20th anniversary of the Mary Tyler Moore Show, the Museum of Television and Radio's Salute to Funny Women of Television, and many more. As an expert on Hollywood history, she regularly appears on radio and television. She's been on the popular TV show Mysteries and Scandals eight times, and she's prominently featured on the wonderful, award-winning, star-studded documentary entitled Sunset Strip. And if that weren't enough, She's the CEO of Living Legends Limited, which represents and arranges personal appearances for over a hundred celebrities. I'm delighted to welcome the fabulous Lori Jacobson to our show. Lori, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Harvey, my pleasure. And thank you for that great intro. I hope I can live up to it. I know you will because you already have. Lori, <laughs> I know that you started out as a stand-up comic. You did improv with Robin Williams, John LaRoquette, and John Ritter, to name a few. How did you go from that to becoming such a successful Hollywood historian and author? Well, I was so excited to be in Hollywood and, and to walk in the footsteps of those people that had made me want to be a performer in the first place. And I found myself asking a lot of questions, like I'd go to Schwab's drugstore. And, you know, this is in the 70s, and we're talking about people who held their jobs for 30 or 40 years back in the day, career waitresses and maitre d's and guards at the studio gates, and no one really asked them questions, you know, and they knew all the dirt. They knew who came in with who, who left with whom. The guards at the gates were often in charge of firing people. When the studio heads didn't have the guts to do it themselves, they would just say, don't let the Bowery boys back on the lot on Monday, tell them they're through. And that's how these people would find out. So these people held a lot of great information. And I found myself asking questions wherever I went. And, and I would entertain my performer friends with these great stories at cocktail parties. And somebody said, you should write a book. <laughs> so I did. Now, I want to talk about your latest book about the Beatles' 1965 concert at Shea Stadium. 
You wrote that you've been a Beatles fan your whole life and that they've had an enormous impact on you. Tell us what the Beatles have meant to you in your life. You know, they just opened such doors for me. They changed everything. And, and I'm not certainly not alone in that. Prior to that, whatever mom had on the radio in the car was pretty much what I listened to. And I was a, a Disney fan and Ed Sullivan was on opposite Disney. And so that was the turning point when the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. I, I switched from childhood to tweenhood, you know, and, and the Beatles, the Beatles changed everything, what we wore, what we talked about, what we listened to, you know, suddenly rushing to the record store to get their 45s and their albums the moment they came out and playing them over and over. And suddenly I was listening to AM radio late at night under the covers with my transistor radio, you know, so uh, they really brought me into my teenage years and their lyrics got more intense over the years. And you really listened to their songs and watched what they were doing and just grew up with them. You actually got to see the Beatles in concert in 1966, correct? Yes, thank goodness. I at least saw them once. What made the Beatles very special for me is that they were really the first group that were the whole package. They wrote their own songs and played all their own instruments on their records. They made music very differently than the artists who came before them, didn't they? Yes, absolutely. Prior to them, and I, and I discussed this in Top of the Mountain, where we were with music prior to the Beatles, the Brill Building was famous in New York. Each room had a different songwriter in it, and you would go from room to room saying, I'm looking for a girl meets boy, girl loses boy, girl wins boy back song and you would keep going to songwriters until you found what you wanted for the singer you represented and that that formula was growing old it was tired and then the Beatles came along now they were in the right place at the right time for sure it could have been anybody that broke that mold. However, the Beatles had already played hundreds of concerts. They were in Hamburg for a long time, and of course in Liverpool, and they played more concerts during those years than a lot of today's artists do in the lifetime of their career. So when opportunity knocked on their door, they were 100% ready. If anyone out there has any doubts that the Beatles changed the landscape of popular music, consider this. In the week that the Beatles first appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, the number one spot on the Billboard Top 100 had been held for 11 weeks by the singing nun. And then the <laughs> Beatles came along. Now that really says it all, doesn't it, Laurie? Yeah, it really does. It really does. A lot of the contributors in your book referred to the state that America was in when the Beatles emerged. JFK had been assassinated. The economy was bad. The civil rights movement was emerging. There was a lot of racial strife. The Vietnam War was starting and the country was in a state of great angst. And so when the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964, the country was hungry for the positive energy that the Beatles gave us. But don't you think the world would have reacted to the Beatles the same way, no matter what else was going on? You know, that's a great question. And that's really hard to say. I, I, our generation was so moved by JFK. The Peace Corps. He was the youngest president we'd ever had. His wife was a glamour puss. He was so handsome and funny. They, he was funny, you know, and he just charmed America. And his loss was tremendous. And especially for the baby boomers, I think, because he brought such promise with him. 
and it was devastating and we really needed a lift. So, you know, was absolutely the perfect storm for the Beatles. Would we have reacted the same way? We cert- I think we would have embraced the Beatles whether or not we we had been through that tragedy, but the tragedy primed us for their for their appearance. There are a few important things about the Beatles, Laurie, that really stood out for me from reading your book. The first thing is that they were very polite to everyone. And the second thing was that even though they liked to party and have fun, they took their work very seriously. Did you pick up on that as well from the people you interviewed? Oh, yes, absolutely. And you know what else? There's another element. They were funny. All four of them were funny. You know, they they came over to America and the press was a little wary of them. But they won the press over with their humor. For example, one reporter asked George Harrison, what do you call that haircut of yours? And George said, I call mine Arthur. And the press fell down laughing, you know, so they they were absolutely charming. And that wonderful, dry English humor. So that really helped them along. And their manager, Brian Epstein, cleaned up their appearance put them in suits and ties, had them bowing after each performance. So, so yes, the polite manner also, you know, he did away with the leather jackets and the attitude and, and they were absolutely presentable. Your book contains some wonderful insights from a whole bunch of celebrities, including Bobby Vinton, Whoopi Goldberg, Meryl Streep, Stephen Van Zandt, and many more. How did you get these people to share their memories with you? You know, when it comes to the Beatles, it seems like all doors open. Meryl Streep still had the same teenage excitement recalling her her time at Shea Stadium and seeing the Beatles that, that she had back in the day. And she told me about the little sign that she had made, Paul, I love you, that she held up. She gave me the names of some other people she thought were at the concert. And I found that true with everyone that I spoke to. And actually, Harvey, that that was my gift in writing the book. Because, you know, life goes on. I'm 10 years old when the Beatles happened. I had all of that wonderful enthusiasm. And, And then life happens to you. And I always loved them and loved their their music. But I had lost that that joie de vivre that I had back in the day. And all of the people that I spoke to that were at Shea still had it when they spoke about their their 27 minutes with the Beatles at Shea. uh, They they were so effusive and excited. They remembered what they wore, where their seats were, had mementos from the evening. and, And I got that back by listening to them. And that was my gift from from all the people that I interviewed. Well, you all gave us a gift because those of us who never got to see the Beatles live got to experience it vicariously through your book. That's one of the reasons I loved it so much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was it was really amazing listening to their stories. The things that audience members made and threw, tried to throw down to the stage, which didn't make it, which pelted people down below. You know, just all these little details were wonderful. And I also found some amazing photos from people who were there. Yeah, that's one of the great things about the book. And I learned so much from your book, Lori. For example, I wasn't aware of the importance of Sid Bernstein. He was a well-respected New York music promoter who had the incredible foresight to contact the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, and book the Beatles one year in advance for two concerts at Carnegie Hall 
and also for the Shea Stadium concert. Everyone seems to think it was Ed Sullivan who brought the Beatles to America, but it was actually Sid Bernstein, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, Sid was booking people like Judy Garland and Tony Bennett. They're very classy acts in the New York area. And he loved to stay fresh and keep learning. So he was taking a class and the teacher recommended that he read papers internationally. And the only he didn't speak any other languages but English. So he got the British papers. And of course, he turned to the entertainment section and he kept reading little blurbs about the Beatles and the word pandemonium was attached to everything he read about them. So he called Brian Epstein, he got Brian's mother and basically said, can Brian come out to play? You know, Brian had been waiting for America to call, hoping they would call. And so Sid was the first person to to make contact and bring them over. Now, in the interim of booking them for Carnegie Hall before they played it, Ed Sullivan is passing through Heathrow Airport on a day when the Beatles happened to be landing and sees hundreds and hundreds of screaming girls and says, what, what's going on? And finds out that Sid, who Ed knew all the big guys knew Sid, finds out that Sid's bringing them to Carnegie Hall. And he calls Sid and said, would you mind if I have them on my show the Sunday before your booking? And Sid thought, well, that would be great. That'll guarantee me a sellout. And so everyone thinks Ed Sullivan was behind the discovery but Ed was just latching on to Sid's coattails. Now, Sid was really generous, and he did not mind that Ed is the one who is associated with the Beatles. And in fact, at Shea Stadium, when Sid Bernstein could have taken the stage and introduced the Beatles, he gave that to Ed Sullivan because he knew that's how people connected the Beatles to America. I was also amazed to find out from your book that Sid Bernstein was able to sell out the entire Shea Stadium concert, 56,000 seats, without even advertising. Isn't that amazing? That is my favorite part of the story. When he made the deal with Brian Epstein, you know, first of all, Brian asked for a $100,000 guarantee. And this is in the fall of 64. And that was un heard of. And then he said, here's my stipulation. I want half of that in three months, or there's no deal. And you can't advertise the concert until you give me the money. And Sid said, how am I going to raise 50 grand without advertising? And Brian said, well, I didn't say you couldn't talk about it. So every day, Sid goes to Washington Square Park in New York, and he tells teenagers, I'm bringing the Beatles to Shea. And it's mostly girls, though there were a few boys. And he got a P.O. box. He set the ticket prices. He handed out that information to the teenagers. And at a time when there's only long distance phone calls, and letters, <laughs> these teenagers carried that message around the world. When Sid finally had the nerve to check his P.O. box to see if there were any orders, he had rubles, he had yen, he got money from behind the Iron Curtain. It was just unbelievable. And I just love that, that this network of teenagers spread the news around the world. It is amazing. And another amazing thing I learned from your book is that although the Shea Stadium concert brought in over $300,000, Sid Bernstein cleared only $3,000 and he got no money from the documentary film. How could that yeah. possibly have happened? Well, the documentary film, I think that was a raw deal. Ed, decided, Ed Sullivan decided to film the concert and he went right over Sid's head to Brian Epstein and neither one of them 
made Sid a producer on the piece. And I, I really thought that stunk. And Sid, being the modest man that he was, didn't make any waves. But clearly there would have been no documentary had it not been for Sid. So that was a real shame. And Sid was set up to certainly make more than $3,000, but the expense, un, unpredictable expenses mounted during the eight months between setting the concert and the concert and his take got smaller and smaller. And I will say, you know, there are very, what I learned from speaking to people in the business is there are very few managers who could handle both the publicity end of managing a client and the financial end. And Sid's gift was clearly with the publicity end. He was the Pied Piper of rock and roll, but he, he wasn't a good money man. I want to ask you about the concert itself. The Beatles sang only 12 songs, and they were on the stage only 30 minutes. Today, a headline act is expected to be on stage for at least 90 minutes. Why was the Beatles' time on stage so short? That was their, that was their act. They, they toured in 64 and in 65 and then they toured again the following year in 66 that was it for their touring years and that's all they ever played pretty much 27 minutes when i saw them in st louis in 66 that was it nine songs time multiplied by three minutes a song a little jabber and uh, you have your 27 minutes. And they had a lot of opening acts. So you were there for an hour and a half, but you weren't seeing the Beatles for that long. And you know, that's, that's the way it was back then. No, no diamond screens. The sound systems were very poor, but it was, you got what you got. Do you think it bothered the Beatles that no one could actually hear their music because there was so much screaming from the audience? I mean, I, yeah. I distinctly remember Ringo Starr saying, people don't come to hear the Beatles, they come to see us. Yes, uh, that, that it, truer words were never spoken. And that is ultimately why they quit touring. They wanted to get, they wanted more time in the studio. They wanted to get to more complicated music that would have been difficult to perform live. And indeed they did. And by 67, they were on to Sgt. Pepper's and, and more. John in particular was very frustrated that people weren't listening to the music. Paul was the showman. He loved being out in front of screaming girls. He <laughs> clearly... He still does because he still is. And, you know, Ringo was, the, was along for the great ride, the newest Beatle. He just thought it was spectacular. George, the quiet Beatle, really wanted to get back in the studio as well. He was all about the music. And actually, there's an interesting story. Several months before Shea Stadium, George and John and their wives were out to dinner at a friend's house. And that friend dosed them with LSD, unbeknownst to them, slipped it into their coffee. George had never even heard of LSD. That's how early on this was. And John was furious, absolutely furious. So fortunately, they had a driver with them that night who took all four of them home. And John and George had what they called a magnificent experience. And from that moment on, George and John were best friends. George considered John his closest friend till the day he died. And, you know, you're always hearing about Lennon and McCartney, but he, here was something I learned that I didn't know. George adored John and vice versa. So they were all about the music and they just wanted to get into the studio. 
There's a really interesting passage in the book by Mary Wilson of the Supremes, who were the only other group to have five consecutive number one hits in 64 and 65. She described what happened when the Supremes met the Beatles at their hotel in New York. She said they didn't really hit it off. The Beatles were smoking marijuana. The Supremes were very straight-laced, well-behaved, clean-cut girls. They found they had nothing in common, so they left. What do you make of that? It's funny because Mary became very, very good friends with George Harrison um, years later. And they talked about that night. You know, George had said, you know, they, the Beatles were friends with the Ronettes and they were more streetwise New York girls and a little bit ghetto, you know, like to keep a beat. And the Supremes were a little more naive and fabulously dressed and when when they went places they were used to a, a hubbub you know they thought there'd be champagne and photographers and the supremes were meeting the beatles and the beatles were sort of nonplussed and uh, these girls came in all dressed up and they thought what what is this and like you said, the Supremes smelled marijuana and they were not in that group at all. Uh, and there was no no photography, nobody marking the occasion. And they stayed about 20 minutes and thought, we're, we're out of here. So the Beatles were expecting something entirely different. And it wasn't until years later that they figured out what went wrong that evening. Well, I think it's because Barry Gordy sheltered the Supremes quite a bit. And also Mary talked about her parents, you know, education. Mary's mother, I think she said she couldn't read and she was not well educated. And it was very important to her that Mary get a good education. When the, when the Supremes parents found out the girls weren't gonna go to college, they, they were devastated, you know, but they were already met when they got their first number one hit, that devastation changed and the parents were happy. But, you know, they were touring the world. They were dining with literally kings and queens. The Beatles did not have that opportunity. They were in their hotel rooms, they couldn't go anywhere, but the Supremes could. And there weren't a lot of women in rock and roll at that time. Mary comments on the only women that she saw were bringing them coffee in their meetings with executives. So they, they were singular in their world at that time. Now, as you know, a documentary film was made of the 1965 Beatles concert at Shea Stadium. For some reason, the movie didn't air on American TV until 1967, and it was not well received because by that time, the Beatles had come out with a lot of new songs, which were not in the concert, and they had changed their public image from the way they looked back in 65. What did you think of the documentary? Well, I remember seeing it. Of course, I watched anything Beatle, and it was already nostalgic by the time it aired in America. They didn't look like that anymore. They didn't sound like that anymore. And I was a little confused by it. A new documentary that was old. So that was a real shame. It aired earlier in the UK, months earlier. But by the time American television okayed it, it, it was late. One of the music industry people in your book said that without the Beatles Shea Stadium concert, there would never have been a Woodstock because the Beatles forced the music industry to develop bigger and better sound systems and technology capable of accommodating those big venues. Lori, until your book came out, I don't think the public fully appreciated the immense significance of that Shea Stadium concert. I'm so glad you wrote this incredible book. It was long overdue. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And yes, the, the impact of the concert was tremendous. First of all, nobody had ever played to 56,000 people before. So that, that was enormous. And 
56,000 rock and roll fans had never been face to face before. And that was life changing for many of the people there. I think every boy in the audience wanted to be in a band after that. And, you know, they real it was very empowering for, for the kids to realize it wasn't just 10 of them sitting around their parents hi fi. This was a, a powerful movement for people. Technology woke up the next morning and said, this is the future, and, and we failed. And Madison Avenue woke up the next morning and said, wow, we've got a whole new marketplace to sell to. And these kids are buying more than pimple cream. We, we need product. Fashion changed overnight from conservative to mod. Including um, hair. Oh, yeah. You know, and then the nude scene in hair and that led to censorship in the film industry being lessened. And we soon saw nudity on film in America for the first time since the 20s. So, it, you know, um, men's hair styling was in barber shops were out. I mean, name me a place you see a barber pole now, you know, that that just disappeared. So it, the impact was absolutely enormous. Well, Laurie, in this interview, we focused exclusively on your Beatles book, but I hope you'll come back again to discuss your other books about Hollywood because they're equally fascinating. Let's do this again soon. Thank you, Harvey. I would love to. And thank you for your insightful questions. I really appreciate it. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. I can't wait to have you back. Thank you so much, Lori. I'll be back. Our guest has been historian, producer, and author Lori Jacobson. Her new book, Top of the Mountain, The Beatles at Shea Stadium 1965, is now available wherever books are sold. And take it from me, it's an absolute must-have for every Beatles fan. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you to our team in LA and the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.